shall we yeah so thank you everyone for joining and this knowledge cafe on research communities and climate action and being open to drive change so I'm just going to give a brief intro on what this session is uh, and what it's part of. Um, my name is Venkat. I work for Open Air, uh, which is an organization based in Europe, and we're running this um, series of events. And this uh, particular session is part of a series of things uh, happening this week. Just before I, I go any further, um, I just want to give some housekeeping rules. So as you will have probably just noticed, this event is being recorded. Um, the part, please make sure that the um, microphones are off during um, the speakers when they're speaking. Um, if you want to participate, uh, we do have the chat function and uh, please use that introduce yourself, um, interact with other participants. And also, but please importantly, this is where you can ask questions to the speakers. Um, we will give the opportunity to, for you to speak as well. So please raise your hand if you would like to do so, and then um, we can do it that way. Uh, the presentation and the recording will be updated in the event page as well. And, at the bottom, you can see a series of hashtags that you can um, also use to tweet about this event. So I'll just give you a brief intro of wh what this is all about. So this is part of the uh, Open Access Week um, 2022. And Open Access Week has actually been running for a number of years now, um, since 2008. And it's an international event. Um, many organizations around the world uh, participate. And each year there's a different theme. Um, so Open Access Week was actually, I should say as well, set up by um, an organization called Spark. Um, you can actually find out more. I'll paste some links later on in the chat window that you can actually follow up on. Um, and I should also thank uh, Irina Kuchma, who's actually um, very closely involved in um, organizing this too. And indeed, there's lots of other people. I am not going to try and mention all the names right here. But the theme of this year is all about uh, climate justice. And what exactly is that? Um, well, um, we've invited expert researchers to discuss this theme and about the research that they're conducting. Um, so we're covering things like oceanic, atmospheric and earth sciences and how this impacts upon trying to um, better uh, change what is happening with uh, climate change, um, monitor it and try to provide solutions. And climate justice in itself means also um, we need equity across the world too, uh, because certainly in low and middle income uh, countries, for example, um, they're more hard hit perhaps, and we need to try and redress the balance. And so this idea of climate justice is also being uh, looked at. Um, but to actually be able to do this, how do you do it? And open science is a big part of this equation, we believe. Uh, this idea that uh, the data generated through research should be, um, especially public research, I should say, uh, is made open to all. And so we want to foster this uh, change in the attitude um, that research is conducted and open science is a big part of that. So in all the, the cases that you'll see uh, following this, the research will be reusing and also providing data to the global community and they will be using uh, technical infrastructures to, to actually facilitate this openness as well. Cool. So we have four speakers for you and I will introduce them right here um, and then uh, let them speak uh, in order. But we have Bjorn uh, Backberg from uh, the C-Scale project and Fulu uh, from Reliance. Uh, Annabella de Oliveira uh, from EGI, EGI ACE project and Professor Spiridon Rapsomanakis, who is from the NENIAS project. All of these projects are based in Europe 
and you will get an idea of um, the research that they're doing and how this is, um, plays a part in open science. So without further ado, I will ask the first speaker, please Bjorn, to um, share your screen and uh, take it away. And thank you for listening. One sec while I get my ducks in a row quickly. Oh, for some reason, it doesn't want to allow me to share. Hang on. I have to quit and reopen. I'll be back in two seconds. Sorry, apologies. Ah, okay. <laughs> Um, may, I, may I suggest, Anne, if you are ready to speak, that maybe you would like to go now. Um, would that be okay? Uh, yes, if you want me. Ah, Bjorn is back oh, no, already. Okay. Yeah, okay. Okay, sorry. <laughs> Take it away, Bjorn. Apologies for that. Uh, it seems that I needed to enable, <laughs> allow the, my computer to um, share the screen. But hopefully you're uh, seeing my screen right now. Yes. Thank you. Okay. So sorry for that technical glitch and uh, glad to be back. So hello, everybody. My name is uh, Bjorn Backerberg. I work at a research institute called Deltaris in the Environmental Hydrodynamics and Forecasting Department. And I'm going to try and give you a perspective on the importance of open access data for climate justice from a more ocean climate dynamics research perspective, which has been the sort of the work that I've been doing for most of my, my research career. So, so I'm gonna, I thought it might be useful to give you a bit of an overview of the kind of research that I do, which, which is both computing and data intensive. Um, and I thought to start out with uh, what I did for my PhD which was uh, modeling the mesoscale scale variability in the ocean. So mesoscale vari variability is essentially all of these meanders that you see in, in the ocean currents and the little eddies that are moving around. And one of the, what, the key topic for my PhD was investigating different numerical methods that improve the accuracy of the model solution. So here in this example, in the top here, you see um, satellite derived currents. Um, and you see that there's a very well-defined current along the southeast coast of South Africa when you look at the, um, the satellite observations. But then when you try to model these in a sort of state-of-the-art numerical model, you find that it gets these exaggerated rings, um, which is not representative of reality. Um, this, the, these two bottom figures here are essentially the same, but they describe vorticity, which is essentially spin in the ocean. So if it's red, the currents are spinning in a red in a in a anti-clockwise direction in the southern hemisphere, um, and blue is the opposite. So what you see here is is the representation of spin or vorticity based on this image here at the top. And then when we apply in the model what we call a fourth order momentum advection scheme, so just a more complicated way to rep, to to model currents, we we find that we are able to represent a more explicit ocean current which is an improvement over this situation on the right here. Now, having said that, if you're implementing more advanced numerical methods, usually these come at some computational expense. So they are more computationally heavy, um, but they do come with advantages. Another way that we can improve our model solution is by just increasing the, the resolution of the model. So going from example, in this case, 10 kilometer resolution in the horizontal to for example, double that five kilometer resolution. And we did this, and we found that, in fact, actually what we see, it doesn't really solve our problems. In this, this is on the right, we have this lower resolution model simulation. You still see these exaggerated eddies propagating into the Atlantic following very similar trajectories as was the case in the previous image. And then on the left is like a model with double the resolution and you see a lot finer detail um, in the model solution, but in fact, the, the problem of these exaggerated eddies is still uh, retained. So improving the model resolution doesn't always solve all of our problems, which was the main message I wanted to bring here. But having said that, if you double the model resolution, you're now making your model twice as heavy, essentially, uh, in terms of the, the data that it's generating. And it, from a point of view of running the model, it also takes a lot longer. 
So I then, I then moved from uh, sort of understanding the numerical methods to try and improve the model solution to looking at ocean data assimilation. And this is a method where we basically use ocean observations to con constrain the model errors. Um, and what, what it basically does, it improves the timing and the positioning of, um, in this case, mesoscale features. So here you have a nice example. If you focus on, on at the top here, there is a, a blue eddy or a blue dot that's propagating south. This is a, a cyclonic eddy, which means um, uh, you would expect features to move clockwise around them. And these black dots that you see here are, are drifter observations. These are actual observations. And you notice that they go right through an, an eddy, which is not what, what should be happening. They should be going around it. And when we apply data assimilation, in this case, at the bottom here, we've assimilated a long track altimetry. We find that it positions the, the eddies correctly so that the, the drifters are actually moving around the features as, as you would expect in reality. So now we're faced with the solution where we have We've got a computationally expensive model that produces a lot of data. And now we're also tra trying to take observational data and ingest it into the model to correct for errors. Um, so there's challenges around making the data uh, talk to your, to your numerical code or your data simulation code. There's challenges around standardization for, for the different numerical data, the model that you, uh, the data that you uh, simulate. And, I thought it might be useful at this stage to give a quick example about the sort of scale of the problem. And to, to do that, I thought it might be useful to just give you a quick rundown on what data simulation actually does. So here's a very, very simple um, uh, analogy. So the problem that we're trying to solve in this case is we are, we are lost at sea and we want to find our position. So we have a model that can estimate the speed of the boat. So by, and then we have our observations that we can use to estimate our position from the stars. But both of these estimates have errors. So now our assumption is that the truth, the green, the green boat here, so where we are actually positioned in space and time, is somewhere between the observations that have error and the model that also has error. So now finding that truth or that analysis is basically what, what we do is we apply a weighting factor to either the to both the model and the observation. So essentially we make some decisions around which one do we trust more, the model or the observations. And then effectively, you um, assimilate those observations into a model to give you a, an improved estimate based on that weighting. And your, your accuracy is essentially then a choice for, of k. You need to basically fiddle with this parameter k to minimize the variation of your true of your analysis or of your truth. So then your analysis is essentially a combination of your model and your observations. So remember, computationally expensive uh, model runs. Uh, produces a lot of data um, and there's a lot of data that are being ingested into the model itself. So it's quite a computationally and data intensive um, process. So that was a very simple um, analogy, but if we sort of convert that into a sort of more realistic application, typically what we, what we find is um, we have in a, in a model system, we have about 10 to the eight variables. So that's a lot of variables. But then the number of observations that we have to constrain those variables are like less than 1% of the entire domain of the model. So then in order to constrain this model with such few data or such few observations, we need to co calculate what we call a multivariate, multivariate covariance matrix, where we basically figure out what is the relationship of one observation with the rest of the model grid. So in order to get there, we have to, at each point in the model, project the model into the observational space, then construct the covariance matrix between the model and the observations, then weigh this covariance matrix according to the model and the observational error covariance, and then multiply the above by, by the difference between the two. And then that way we calculate the analysis. And then our relatively sim our very simple equation looks something more like this, where you have an analysis, which is a, a matrix, a model field, which is a matrix. Then you have a model covariance matrix at the observational positions, which is a very, very large matrix which you then have to divide by two other fairly large matrices, namely the error covariances. And then you multiply by, that by another matrix with the, with the innovation. So you see these are a lot of complex computationally, uh, computationally intensive um, uh, calculations, matrix calculations that need to be done. So, and that's just to constrain the model at one time step. So whenever you run the model, you, you run the model, say for argument's sake, for, for seven days to produce some forecast, 
you let the model diverge in terms of its error, and then you stop the model, and then you run this whole system to bring the model back, the model error back to some, to some uh, state, and then you rerun it again. So now when you combine models and observations and climate research, you need to do this over long, long, long time series. So we need to be able to run our model for you know, 50 to 100 years to, to really understand the climate dynamics. And here's an example of the kind of output that you could see. This is actually derived from satellite observations. And what it shows you is the, the energy in the ocean um, and its long-term trend. So you'll see areas of red is where the ocean currents have increased, the mean ocean currents have increased in terms of speed. So you see here north of, uh, north of Madagascar and along the east coast of South Africa, there's an increasing trend. Um, and then along the, but then it changes to a decreasing trend. And it, overall, if you look at the variability, so these is the eddies. So the red areas just indicate where um, the variability has increased over the, the sort of satellite record. So to really, so this image was um, calculated based on satellite data. And satellite data typically only covers the surface of the ocean, but you really want to understand what happens in the interior in order to really quantify the mechanisms that are responsible for this. Um, and for that, you really need to combine these data simulative ocean models with in situ observations and satellite data to really quantify the processes that are contributing to these long term trends. And now you see how we're now combining um, vast amounts of data from different sensors, from different platforms. There's satellite platforms, there's in situ platforms. Um, and then you're combining those with you know, computa computationally intensive models that in turn also produce a ton of data. So about, goodness, 12, 15 years ago when I started doing this research, um, you know, I, I was still in a, able to kind of download the data to my local computer and do all of the processing there and then create a result. But, and this is exactly what, I've been, what, what we've been doing in the past. This is kind of how we analyze data in the past. We, there's a whole bunch of data available. There are different files and typically in different formats that you download to your computer. Then you have to get them all into a generic format and then you can do some sort of analysis and create a result. Now, one of the challenges that we're faced with these days is that the satellite data, for example, is becoming increasingly high in terms of resolution. So here's an example on the, on the left, you have Sentinel-2A, which comes at 10, 10 meter resolution. So you see, it's, it's a little bit blurry compared to the you know, 0.8 meter resolution from planet data, but even 10 meter resolution is a vast improvement over this data, which was 25 kilometer resolution in, 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 um, yeah, in space. So, so what, this is a huge improvement in our sort of monitoring system and we've even got higher resolution data available. So now the problem that I've described in terms of numerical modeling, data simulation and analyzing satellite data is sort of exploded in terms of the resources that you need in order to do this. And it's no longer possible to do this on your, on your local machine. So this scenario where we, where we bring the data to the compute is, is fine when you're working with sort of order megabytes of data, but it becomes sort of increasingly difficult or almost impossible when you move to sort of order gigabytes, terabytes or petabytes. So what that means is we need to think of a, we need to do things differently. So here we, we and, and that's quite evident in the Earth observation space at the moment where, where people are, instead of downloading the data to their local computer, they are bringing the analysis, the model or the processing to where the data is living. So you basically, we, we make use of APIs, we send jobs to, to, the, to the data that is hosted on some sort of compute, and then we just retrieve the result, which makes um, life as a researcher much easier. There's a but. Oh, and, and this, is kind of, this is kind of what we're trying to achieve in the C-Scale project, which is the a Copernicus EOSC analytics engine. And basically what we're trying to do is we're trying to federate all of the European compute and data providers into sort of a harmonized system so that, that I as a user can use this platform. And I don't know whether I'm computing in Portugal and po Poland. Um, my user experience is the same. I have all of the tools and data readily available for me and I don't have to spend any time dealing with complicated, setting up complicated computing infrastructures in order to do my processing. Now, this situation is exactly what we're trying to, trying to build in the C-Scale project because Especially specifically for Copernicus and Earth observation data, 
there is no single European processing backend that can really serve all of the data sets of interest to the scientific community. And then if you look at the sort of ecosystem of platforms, there is a huge variety of them. And it's really difficult as a scientist to kind of um, figure out which one serves my needs. They all have different approaches or different technologies that they use. There's um, standardization that, that different standards that they uh, adopt as well in terms of the data that they serve. So the challenges here are vast and navigating the system is quite overwhelming for, for, for us researchers. So in C-Scale, the, really the objective is to support open science. And what we plan to do is deliver a, a federated compute and data, oops, see, data infrastructure, which provides a seamless user experience for analyzing you know, computing uh, Copernicus data. Um, the idea is to have access to optimized data, and uh, which is both low, low level as well as the higher level analysis ready data, which is what the scientists typically are interested in. Um, they want to use the analysis ready data to basically just feed into my data simulation pipeline. Um, and where these analysis ready data aren't available, we want to be able to provide on demand solutions so that users can generate these data where they aren't available. The whole C scale infrastructure is being co designed, tested, and piloted by the research communities. And I'm one of the researchers that is um, testing this infrastructure to basically help the, the uh, infrastructure providers build a platform that is useful for the community. So what does this really mean for the end user? So at the end of the day, we want to enable users to quickly and easily generate meaningful results so that they don't have to get bogged down in technical infrastructure details to get their data and processing and analytics to work. They can just kind of arrive at C-scale, um, request resources, and then they can focus on doing the science, which is what they're good at. And then the infrastructure pro providers can focus on the technologies, which is what they're good at, to really support the scientists focusing on science. Um, and here, what we're talking about is abstracting complexity away from the end user and providing homogenous access to resources. What this all means in the, um, in the sort of open, what, what this means is that from a data point of view, it's also incredibly important that the, the data is openly and, and easily available, um, that the standards are consistent across the different platforms that you're working on. This will all help a researcher really focus on the science and not have to always convert things into different formats, et cetera, et cetera, to, to get to a result. The amount of uh, machine learning is a very nice example. Most machine learning experts become data wranglers where they spend a vast amount of their time just making sure that the data is in the right format so that they can put it into the machine learning pipeline. And that is essentially the, what we are trying to overcome for them. So here are the key project results from our, from our project. So we aim to deliver a, a, a uh, computing and data platform, which we call FedEarth Data, which gives you uniform access to a federation of computing and data providers that are all harmonized and follow consistent standards in terms of how they operate. There's a, a processing platform that allows you to send jobs um, to the providers instead of, instead of having to download the data locally. Um, there's a metadata query service that we're, we're building, which allows people to find the data. That is also an incredibly important aspect. Sometimes it's very difficult to find the data that we're, we're interested in. And a lot of um, projects are building catalogs. And you know, if you look at the European landscape now, there's almost these um, catalogs of data sort of scattered as outcomes of projects all over the environment. And, and now you also now as a researcher need to make heads or tails of the different catalogs and what they do. Um, so this metadata query service is aimed to overcome that challenge. Um, finally, we're building workflow solutions um, in this project, which is essentially easy to deploy workflows that support um, monitoring, modeling and forecasting applications. So these are like building blocks to enable um, application developers or researchers that want to build a, a, a data processing pipeline that these are reusable building blocks that basically fast, fast track uh, researchers to go from having nothing in place to having something in place. And then finally, we have a, um, a CCL community page, which is where you can come and engage with us in the project. And that was, that was it for me. Thank you very much for your attention. Thanks, Bjorn. Only two minutes over time, I think. So that's <laughs> good. <laughs> and there's a technical, yeah.
pitch at the beginning. Um, thank you very much. And we'll take questions at the end, please. Uh, so if I could just move on to Anne, please. Um, Anne? Yes. Thank you. I think you should see my screen. So as you said, I'm Anne, yes. and uh, I was working in the Department of Geosciences, uh, Geosciences at the University of Oslo, but I just moved three weeks ago to a similar. Uh, and uh, in my talk, I will mostly focus on uh, why open science matters to me um, and how I practice open science in uh, my work. And along the way, I will try to link to climate justice. Uh, so why does open science matter to me? So first, uh, because I want to search, find, and access relevant resources. So uh, I'm, and I'm a climate data scientist, so published papers are not really sufficient. So I write a lot of programs, I develop new algorithms, and of course I analyze a lot of data and very large amount of data. So what's very useful for me is, uh, for instance, to, uh, to find a Jupyter notebook. Uh, that shows how I can use data I'm interested in. So typically, for instance, Copernicus data, which are very, very large, uh, because I don't want to start from scratch, because I, I, I want to be able to build upon something that is already available, and it saves me a lot of time. So second, uh, because reproducibility and reuse matters to me. So for instance, if I find a Jupyter notebook, this is really great, but I, I want to make sure it can rerun. And I want to check the results so to make sure um, I start from like a sound basis from a scientific point of view and technical point of view. So then uh, this is the most interesting part of uh, my job. Uh, I can start to create some derivative work. So I can apply the same analysis, but over uh, different data sets or over different geographical area. So for instance, here you see there is an analysis over Italy, but maybe I want to do something over Spain, but still using the same methods. Maybe later I want to change the methods. And here, collaboration uh, is very, very important. So I, I never, ever work alone. And sharing what I do when I'm doing it, it saves me a lot of time because uh, it, can reduce, uh, it can reduce potential issues such as, well, it works for me on my laptop, but uh, it doesn't work for others or vice versa. So that's the second thing. And the third one is because I want my work to be reused and cited. So I don't want to retain my research work. I want others to benefit from it as soon as possible. So not, not when I publish, like maybe one or two years later, because it takes time. So for this, I want to, uh, to register my work early, uh, for instance, like on, on a web portal, which is very user friendly. And of course, my main objective here uh, is to get more citation and uh, potentially to initiate a new uh, collaboration. Um, so now let's focus on the how. How do I practice open science? Um, so I said in my previous slide, I'm sharing uh, while doing. So what I want to do is I want to register my work very early. And I, I do it in what we call a research object portal. So it's a web application online. Uh, and I want my research work to be found by others. So it's live. So I can add things when available, but I can also remove things that are no longer relevant. So I, at the very beginning, what do I share? I share uh, IDs and uh, we share IDs and we collaborate to refine them. So uh, if you want to understand climate change and mitigate its impact, you need to work with a very interdisciplinary team. So it cannot work alone. So we can use tools slash, uh, like a mirror board and uh, we can uh, discuss and uh, uh, improve the IDs. And then at some point we will we'll discuss on the task and uh, who can do what. Uh, and we can also identify po potentially missing expertise. Do we need additional collaborators, for instance, to fulfill the, the work? And this is where we start. So when we start, we usually start from the data. And we, we, are, we want to analyze a large amount of data, very, very big data like Copernicus data. So we want to make them available to everyone. So we use online tools uh, and uh, like, for instance, uh, um, Amazon Object Storage, and we can use EGI Data Hub and uh, Adam Platform. So they are all uh, tools available, uh, developed by others. But we also want to share the tools we use for analyzing the data. So not only the tools we use, where we get the data. Um, and from this tool, we can uh, access the data sets. 
and we can analyze them. And we also use online tools um, such as the uh, EGI Jupyter Notebooks and uh, uh, the Galaxy Climate Science Workbench, and we can create very complex workflow and generate new research results that everyone can reuse. And finally, we want to communicate with us. And uh, so we can write papers uh, like everyone else, but we can also write software papers, but we can also write blogs and tweets, so like different types of communication to make sure uh, this is a bit more uh, spread. Um, so let me show you an example. So um, I'm mostly working on, on the atmosphere part and uh, uh, recently working on the impact of COVID-19 lockdown on air quality. So it's, it's still ongoing work, uh, and it's also a topic that can relate to climate justice in, uh, to some extent. And what, uh, what you see in here is my research work as made available live uh, uh, on this uh, web interface, which is WorldHub Research Object Portal. So here you have like a title, which is uh, not using any jargon or not too much. You have the author, you, um, you have the list of uh, everyone who, who has collaborated on this work. It has some keywords, so it, uh, it's easier for others to find out what it is about. And it has many discovered metadata. So keywords and sentences that were automatically extracted for all the, from all the research work I, I deposited here. Um, so this is very helpful because my work is more likely to be found, so to be reused and maybe to be extended. And anyone can reuse it, even if it is not finalized. So you can, for instance, fork it, and you can get your own copy and you can start to create some derivative work on your own or with other collaborators. Um, so here you see the different resources uh, and I try to organize them to make it easy for others to reuse. So you can see some links to bibliographical resources and I can include videos, newspaper, not necessarily only scientific papers. Um, in the input folder, uh, I will put everything that is related to, to the data set I have used, and uh, the data set will get also plenty of information about the data, uh, where uh, you can get them. And it is also associated to uh, the tools you can use for analyzing of a visualization, the visualization of the data itself. So for instance, here, if you click on this small cube, this is what you will get. It says you can open it in Adam platform. So Adam platform is an online tool, which you can use to visualize data and a new window will pop up and you will see the data, which uh, is this data. So this is nitrogen dioxide from uh, Copernicus data, air quality forecast. And you can uh, here, you can zoom, you can uh, change the geographical area uh, so you can change the date, so you can already have an idea of what I have been using and maybe what you can reuse in different contexts. Um, and this is the same for the tools. So here you have a tool folder and the, the tools, so the data analysis part of, the, uh, of my work, you can also get it. So for instance here, when you click on, on this link, it will say it will open uh, the resources in the EGI notebook and the EGI notebook is fully reproducible, so you can rerun it, but you can change it, so you can update it, and you can make your own uh, work. So if I want to summarize, um, I share my work, and I try to share it at all stages, and uh, because I really want to facilitate reuse of, uh, of what I, I do by others, uh, so they, can, they don't have to reinvent the wheel. Uh, there is one thing I haven't mentioned, which I think is very important. Uh, when you share and when you communicate to increase, for instance, the collective benefit, uh, it, it also comes with uh, additional responsibilities. So when I share, and I think I, I should say before I share, uh, I need to, to think about um, will it harm someone if I share this data or this analysis? So uh, that is what I, what, what I want. I want my, my research to be fair, so to be findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. But I also want to think about the care principles. So the care principles were initially defined for indigenous people. And this is all about collective benefit, authority to control, responsibility, and ethics. Um, and the responsibility of the researcher is, uh, is also to understand uh, how to share, what to share, and when to share. Um, let's uh, uh, take here an example. Um, this is where poacher were using science papers to target newly discovered species. 
So for instance, if you share the location of endangered species, it's potentially harmful. So it's a, I guess it's like for sensitive data in medicine. You, you don't want to give the data to everyone. There are some protocols to respect, and this is quite important. But you can share the methods or the data analysis, and you can also provide, for instance, randomized and anonymized data sets to facilitate uh, reuse. Um, so now when, when it comes to ethics and responsibility, I think we, we can have recommendations at so, uh, policy level. But I think this is also where community of practice comes into play. So it's also very important that we, as community, organize ourselves. So we discuss and grow together to do better open science and uh, to be um, a bit more, uh, not only open, but uh, to, to care. So this is what we are trying to do, uh, to try to achieve with this uh, environmental data science book. So it's an initiative led by Alejandro Coca Castro. It's from the Island Turing Institute. And the idea is to uh, onboard others. Uh, so we want others to practice open science to create reproducible, scalable, and shareable environmental data science. So, and this is also useful for climate justice. So the, the idea is to define to, together, um, to discuss on guidance and best practices to increase collective benefits. So uh, we provide templates, for instance, for Jupyter Notebooks, and we all uh, try to agree together on what would be a better way to, uh, to do open science in this context. So typically, we recommend to have a title, to, uh, to provide some uh, tags, some keywords, uh, to give the context uh, without using jargon, uh, to list all the contributors. We also recommend uh, the work to, to separate uh, like the data access from the analysis to make it uh, easier to reuse the same uh, work, um, but with different data set or different data analysis. And of course, we, uh, we encourage everyone to cite uh, what, uh, what is used in the analysis, and, and not only the paper, but also the software and the tools. Uh, and we also want to encourage collaboration, because if you want to, uh, to mitigate climate change, you need interdisciplinary research. So uh, we also have this collaborative review so to to ensure reproducibility so we have both a scientific and technical review and the final work is uh, is archived in zenodo so we want to notify everyone that okay we will no longer work on this live uh, jupyter notebook or live research object um, then we publish it and others can also continue the work and create new derivative work um, so we can also create a training material, so we organize co-working session and discussion around open science, but with very, very concrete examples, so it's very like a bottom-up approach. Um, and that's it, um, that's uh, the end of my presentation. Um, you are encouraged to join and contribute, and uh, you can contact me here with uh, my new contact details. Um, I try to highlight how I contribute to open science and to some extent to climate justice. And I, I know that it's very, very minor contribution when it comes to climate justice. Uh, and I mean, it's mostly through sharing my work and working open to empower others. But um, I said in the title, every little helps. So thanks a lot for your attention. Thank you very much, Anne. Right on time. Well done. Um, and, you know, yeah. We are, we're all part of uh, minor cogs in a bigger um, uh, overall aim in, in trying to drive change. So um, all research builds towards that. Um, thank you. And if I can move on to Annabella, please. Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. I'm going to share my screen. I hope you can see it well. Yes, and if you can go full screen. Okay, okay, Thank full you. screen. Okay, so I'm Manuel Oliveira. I'm a coastal engineering, a researcher from the National Laboratory for Civil Engineering. And I'm going to talk with you, uh, following very well Anne's presentation, a very concrete uh, uh, example on how open data can uh, contribute and help uh, people address uh, climate change impacts on the coast. Um, open coast, what I'm going to talk about today, is an on-demand open coastal forecast tool uh, to support uh, daily management and emergency at the coast. This is one of the thematic services from HIAs, a very large project that brings in a lot of researchers from many disciplines 
together with the IT people that develop the core services that uh, make computational resources, as we see previously, uh, available for everyone to do their research in a very simple and uh, user-friendly way. So, oh, and I forget to say, I'm a part of the hydraulics and the environmental department of the NEC. Okay, so why to, what is the motivation for this work and how does it fit in in a climate change context? Uh, you all know that uh, our coastal regions are experienced very uh, severe fragility and probability associated with climate change. So our coastal managers and uh, the community in general uh, need to have some support in anticipating hazardous events and being able to manage emergency actions in the, in the proper way to protect uh, people and assets. And they also need information about the coast for the, their daily activities. And also for the public, for their uh, sailing, uh, swimming, all those nice uses of our beautiful coasts. Finally, um, the knowledge of the coast is also very important to guide the management to minimize climate change and other risks. Um, and for users to be able to intervene when it's necessary. So what is our vision? What is behind the development of this tool? Is to develop a tool that is user-friendly, can be used by everyone, and provide cost of forecasting at the systems that the users want. So it's not a tool for a specific coastal system. It's a tool that can be applied in any place on the coast all over the world. And it is part of the effort towards developing coastal digital twins, uh, a mechanism that is being promoted in Europe to make the capacity to simulate and test what if climate change scenarios available to everyone in a very user friendly way. So, uh, in a very uh, short uh, definition, what is Open Coast? Open Coast is a, a platform that uh, builds on-demand forecast systems for a coastal area of interest and it generates all the, the information that we need at the coast. Uh, water levels, wave parameters, velocities, salinities, temperatures, and also water quality. It is based uh, in models similar to those that Bjork talked about that are run in an automatic way every day and they are based on the, the representation of all the relevant physical and biogeochemical processes. So why, why is, is open coast different from the, what the other forecast systems that have been around for a decade or two? Uh, typically forecast systems are, are tools that are very complex to set up and to maintain an operation in a daily way. And uh, this would make, uh, for instance, poor regions of the, the planet not being able to, to have to take advantage of these tools for their daily activities. So the goal in open coast is in open coast is to make these tools available to everyone in a very simple way. So you, you don't need to be uh, a numerical modeler or a coastal engineer in order to be able to use open coast and to set up a forecast system for your system of interest. So by doing this, we are simplifying and hiding all the complexity of these systems uh, through the use of something that is very important here. We share the European uh, computational resources that are necessary to have a robust tool and a, a tool that runs every day without any intervention from the user. The user just needs to go inside the tool when he or she wants to look at the results and predictions for the day. So this makes everything very simple to use. Uh, from a, a more research point of view, we also made this tool very user-friendly for those people that want to build on top of it. So it's very flexible on the four things that you want to use, and I will talk a little bit more about this. The, the process is physical or biogeochemical that you want to use, and also on numerical models that are behind it. So giving the user all the freedom that he or she wants to, pr to produce their forecasts. Finally, we also have a, a very flexible IT uh, architecture built on top of the European Open Science Cloud uh, that, uh, that allows uh, this system to be implemented not only 
where we have it in the cloud, but also in a, a proprietary way in, in one specific institution where confidential issues may be at, at stake. So just a very brief uh, overview of what uh, we have in this tool. Uh, we have three main pillars. The first one, uh, the, the user configures the, the forecast that he or she wants to, to operate. It, uh, the, the banner in the top shows the several steps. So the user is, is led the step by step with a lot of help in the procedure if it's needed. And uh, I, I like to, to, to talk about it is like going to the supermarket. So you pick up everything that you need from each shelf. And in the end, you just have your, your full cart. The, the nice thing about this is that this is open science. It's open software, open access and open, open software tools that everyone can uh, interact, use, and also build on top of it. So we want to, to contribute towards uh, coastal forecasting as an everyday tool for everyone. Uh, then we have the forecast manager. For, uh, this is particularly interesting for researchers where they want to ex experiment numerical uh, parameters, for instance, and they can have multiple forecasts at the same time. And it's very easy to do using this, this manager. Finally, this is not useful at all if we cannot look at the results, download the results, download the input files. So we have an output viewer where the user can look at the maps, probe over the, the results in a very straightforward and easy way. So why, why uh, open coast is relevant in this context of open data? Uh, open coast is not uh, just data, it's data and numerical models. Uh, in the sense that we, we run the models, but we provide automatic comparison with real-time data, for instance, from the Sentinel images uh, processed for, for instance, the water level, or for the, the, the automatic comparison with the data from MODNET. So the users know that the forecast that they are producing, the quality they are going to get in the end. Uh, right now, we are using uh, these all over the world. We have users all, in all continents. And what is interesting, it, we don't have just researchers using the open coast. We have many, many managers that are looking at this tool as a, a very important way to understand their system and to take uh, adequate uh, management decisions. Uh, so why, um, how are using open data here? besides making all of this work uh, available and open to everyone. All of this work relies on open data from an, a, multi, uh, a series of providers. And this is very important because without this open data that we use to force our models every day, open cost won't be possible. So it's very important when we build a workflow of procedures that all the information that is already there, that someone has invested time and money to, to build, can be reused by others. And we are a very good uh, example of reusing the data from global and regional providers. For instance, forecasts from the atmospheric fields, from GFS, Meteo Galicia, Meteo France, the, the global time levels from FES 2014, and as I said previously, the ModNet uh, data stations then th that can be uh, get in an automatic way and introduced into our system. All of this is done automatically. So the user just has to, to say what he or she wants to, to use. One specific forecast provider, one specific comparison with field data. And uh, all of this, again, runs on top of the, again, open access computational resource that they ask, the European Open Science Cloud, that allow us to set up, run the simulations and uh, archive the results av available to everyone. So another important aspect on open data, and uh, you, have, you have heard it before. Uh, none of the data can be reused if it doesn't follow standards, and it's not developed in a way that computers can go and grab it to produce new knowledge. So uh, OpenCoast and the, the, the automatic service in, in GIS 
are all following the, the standards the standards in their community. In this case, we follow the standards for the coastal and the seismographic communities. And by doing this, we allow a very easy way to produce new features. For instance, right now we are building the capacity for the computational grid to be built in an automatic way. So the user doesn't need to have any information at all, just wants to say, I want to make a prediction in the North Sea. And they start here and it ends there. So, and this is possible only because it's all built in this workflow of open functionalities uh, procedures. Finally, we, we would like also, and in this uh, context of open data and open science, to allow users to be able to share their applications to other users. For instance, if one user works in the North Sea and uh, another user is interested in the output of that application of open course, he or she will be able to, to access it if the, the, the original user allows it. So to summarize uh, what we have here, an example of how open science and open data is really fundamental for us to build tools that can address societal challenges. Uh, so it's an open access web portal where people can go and build their systems. It's all based in open source software. And uh, we hope that by making, creating this tool and making it available to everyone that we can allow people over the world to understand how their postal systems behave how it will evolve in the future, not only due to climate change, but also due to human interventions uh, and their consequences. So I'm leaving here just two links for you to browse. The first one is the access to the open coast service. And the other one is goes beyond the open coast. It uh, deals with all the thematic services in EGIS. And uh, I also welcome you to, to go and uh, browse through the very nice tools they have there. And this is all I have for you. Thank you so much for your attention and I'd be glad to answer any questions. Thank you very much, Annabella. Excellent. Uh, yeah, and if there's any questions, please do post in the, in the chat window, please. And uh, let's move on to our final speaker, um, Professor Samanakis. Um, please take it away. Hello. Uh, I don't know if you can give me the screen. Um, yes, please. Uh, do you have your presentation? Yeah. Uh, you should be able to share your screen. Okay. Anybody can see it? Yes, thank you. Okay. Uh, let me expand it if I can. Okay. Uh, the project that we run is the Aeneas. It's a novel services for emerging atmosphere and the water and space challenges. Uh, basically, uh, uh, climate um, is um, a theme that, is con that concerns the atmosphere um, service. But I'll uh, carry on and speak about underwater and, uh, and services and some of the services of the atmosphere that do not have anything to do with climate. Um, in the present situation, uh, I was responsible for Section 3, the Atmospheric Research Services. Uh, they are services that anybody can use. Um, they can get their own data or use data from databases and uh, treat them uh, with the research services that are available um, in the atmospheric research services. Um, service one in our case um, is the greenhouse gases flux density monitoring service and implementation. Uh, at the front end of the service is a simple user friendly, friendly interface that accepts the data and guides the, guides the user to obtain the desired flux densities and energy balance results. Uh, it is possible by the user to upload data from his own database or from any other database. Um, I have to say here that uh, calculating gas 
greenhouse gases flux density or uh, in this case of water uh, the water fluxes or any kind of fluxes mass uh, flux, uh, mass fluxes is not a trivial case it's not a trivial um, it's a not a trivial science it's not a trivial thing and it's very complicated and of course i'm taking a step back uh, in what has been said so far uh, it's how to obtain this data um, i heard um, discussions mainly not only of course on how to uh, get this big data, treat them, and share them. Uh, in this case, we go a step back is how to obtain this data and then treat this data and then make it available to open access. Um, in this case, in our case, uh, what we used in um, NIAS, we used many on the left, you can see the projects where we obtain data. And uh, you can, in the middle, you can see the method we used, the actual physical method that we used to treat the data. And then you can see where we deposited the data and how big the data were. Um, I'll have to stress again that um, uh, the way to obtain this data is very expensive. Instrumentation is very expensive. It needs, um, uh, well experienced scientists or even PhD students won't do the job well uh, and we use two methods to obtain flux densities uh, in our case for greenhouse gases uh, the eddy covariance micrometeorological method and the gradient method of four heights dynamic gradient method uh, we deposited the data also at the European flux database cluster in, um, in Italy, and there is an Ameriflux database. Also, one can obtain data from there or compare his the way he treats the data from the Ameriflux database, or you can one can see a greenhouse gas fluxes from Japan stations uh, at the bottom uh, uh, address. Uh, so, uh, the theme here is that. Um, uh, the way we uh, deposited our algorithm in the Aeneas, one very simply can go and use his data or her data and uh, pro, uh, obtain fluxes of greenhouse gases. Uh, why we still need fluxes of greenhouse gases is that, uh, as it is well understood from the research community, is that um, uh, these data are missing all over the world. Uh, what we get um, from uh, the IPCC on climate change are data calculated from emission, uh, from uh, inventory emissions. And data, real data of greenhouse gases emissions are scarce or very difficult to obtain. Um, the eddy covariance method. Um, is so well used by our group. Uh, we started using it very long ago, and our first expedition was ACE2 over the Atlantic in year 2000. Uh, we are so uh, bold then that we use the eddy covariance method from the aircraft. Um, uh, the, we obtained data on, uh, in that case, we obtained data on. Um, uh, entrainment and detrainment velocities. Uh, you will see later, uh, we also used air aircraft data uh, from Athens Thermopolis using the variance method. We flew over Athens at three or four different heights and obtained fluxes of uh, pollution in Athens uh, at that time. Uh, we also have a station and we use uh, in the station medical variance and gradient method. Uh, but all data are available. Uh, I have to say they are uh, treated for uh, standard deviation, uh, deviation, and uh, what we like to do also is uh, give out error propagation on our data. Um, 
this is an example uh, of our station uh, in Exanti, uh, a tall 125 meter uh, tower. And uh, here, one, one, one of the examples is that one can see the sensible heat, uh, latent heat, and net all wavelength radiation. And to simplify matters is that um, using this uh, heat, uh, Fluxes, we can see uh, mass fluxes, water vapor or CO2 uh, between the surface of continents and the atmosphere. And hence, we may have a transpiration that may be useful uh, to the agricultural uh, sector. Also, we can have the footprint of agricultural products and so on and so forth. The key uh, focus here is that these data are not very easy to obtain. If I go then uh, to the second section of my analysis, uh, the second section uh, is concerned with modern, monitoring atmospheric perturbations and components in active tectonic regions. And uh, uh, the University of uh, in Milano, Bicca, Bicocca, uh, has data, uses the data uh, in the sense that uh, they want to look. At, uh, and correlate gas or other emissions from faults in Mount Etna, Italy, and earthquake activity along the same faults, and looking at the kinematic type, what type of earthquake they may have. Uh, they obtain the data, they have the data, and they try to see if they can predict uh, earthquake activity. Um, of course, this goes for Mount Etna and uh, Nea and Volcano and Santorini. And Santorini is a very nice resort, but uh, opposite it is the Nea Kameni, which is an uh, active uh, volcano. Uh, very small activity, but still active. And we want to see it generates uh, earthquakes. Uh, finally, our Portuguese um, uh, collaborators uh, uh, trying to give us an idea of the urban air quality estimation and monitoring and forecasting. And if one can see here the city of Porto, and uh, they're trying to see what happens uh, with air pollution in Porto. Um, and then uh, with their algorithm, trying to see which are the hotspots and from the hotspots um, direct the local authority uh, to redirect uh, uh, the, the activity of uh, cars and public transport. And they use real data also uh, from places in Porto. And um, with this, they build their own algorithm. Uh, these things I had to say, uh, but uh, I would have liked to have uh, spoken a lot more about our work on uh, climate change since we worked since 1990 on climate change but i think my time is too short <laughs> and uh, i believe that sharing this data since the data are not uh, there is not a lot of data on greenhouse gas, gas fluxes from the earth let alone from the oceans uh, it's an area where data, data have to be said. There are so few. And uh, of course, uh, I'm a strong believer that uh, uh, using greenhouse gas fluxes and uh, anything that's concerned with climate, uh, climate change and greenhouse gas uh, concentrations in the atmosphere, atmosphere and everywhere, uh, it's not correct to use uh, Emission inventories that go out, go out there and measure the fluxes and uh, uh, calculate correctly what are the predictions of what's going to happen to the climate of this planet. Uh, a great example is the methane flux from Siberia, and a lot more. Uh, I can answer a lot of questions at the end. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you so much. Great. Um, that's brilliant. And um, OK, well, we now have a Q&A uh, section of this panel um, session. 
Um, feel free to ask any questions um, in the chat uh, as I've posted there. But maybe to get things rolling, um, I have a few questions that I might want to ask. And one of the things that uh, you might have seen um, repeated through uh, at least two of the talks, I think, uh, was something called uh, the EOSC, or some people call it the EOSC, um, which actually stands for the European Open Science Cloud. And uh, it's essentially a federated um, series of data and services and so forth that are across Europe. Um, and I see that some of the, the researchers, guest speakers here, that they've been using this as well. And I invite um, anyone, perhaps um, one of the speakers, to uh, describe a bit more about how this has actually helped in their research. Um, is there someone that can actually um, crystallize how this has been of real use and importance to their research, please? I can start and then the art follows me. Um, sure, thank you. <laughs> so, what I've presented today is uh, a tool that uh, needs to run models every day. And uh, in order to run the models, it needs computational resources every day. And make, needs to make sure that the resources are there, they are working, and uh, that we also have access to what is called core services. So what is the OSC? Is the OSC is a federated infrastructure <clears throat> that congregates computational resources and data repositories from all over Europe that work in a seamless way. So looking from the point of view of a researcher, I am able to run my service on top of this infrastructure and using their, what is called core services, for instance, to authenticate my users. OpenCoast is an application that requires a user to have uh, an access. And we need to make sure that this is a valid user, it's a valid researcher or a valid coastal manager wanting to do good things. So we use EOSC not only for the computational power, but for all the services they provide to help me make my platform work every day. I, I made a very practical uh, presentation of EOSC. Brilliant. And just follow up on that, and maybe someone else can uh, jump in as well. But in like, terms of, uh, if oh, if you would like, uh, um, I could say a few word, words about um, Neanias and Neos. Uh, I believe Please that, do. Um, I believe the services of uh, Neanias and Neos are free to everybody. Uh, so even though they may not be specialists in what they are trying to do, uh, they can run the services of the ideas uh, and um, ask questions, come back to us um, and uh, explain to them what, what's happening with these services. But we can also um, get data via uh, INEOSC uh, that otherwise would not have been available and um, try our own uh, try our own data <laughs> if one can say that uh, so it's a dynamic exchange of data of algorithms and services for the whole community so uh, think of it as uh, a dynamic place where you can get data try your data correct your data correct your algorithms and discuss with others about the algorithms you are using to treat your data. So I find it very helpful, <laughs> not only by putting our own algorithms there for everybody to use, but also for getting data and exchange ideas and, and make corrections to our algorithms and their algorithms. Excellent. Thank you very much. And uh, Bjorn, you have your hand up as well. I just, yeah, exactly. <laughs> I just wanted to uh, also 
make make a comment so i sit a little bit on the sort of interface between being a, like a, a scientific end user of eos but also sort of partially contributing to the development of the capabilities in the european open science cloud and what i really value about the european open science cloud is this access to to cross-disciplinary services or tools for example the in the the earth observation community or the earth science community you could argue has got relatively less experience into when it comes to for example big data um, and the high energy physics community for example has been dealing with big data issues since the early 2000s when they needed to federate all of the uh, computing infrastructures in europe in order to deal with the big data coming out of the large hadron collider for example so they've spent a good 15 to 20 years now building all of these tools that that actually that manage for example big data logistics that, that allow for exchange of data that allow for federated computing and it's these core services that are really enabling us as the sort of end users to leverage them in, in other applications for example federating around copernicus data and there's a question in the chat from uh, julia which is um we do need to spend time to learn these services, but typically, in, in my experience, we have a lot of support from the providers of the services and the infrastructures. And that's also a really nice added value of working in this environment is that you get to collaborate with the experts in, in things that you might not necessarily understand. Thanks. Thanks, Bjorn, for picking up on the question. I was going to bring it up. <laughs> um, yes, and, and you touched on that. that uh, a big part of what open science is, and I, I hope um, will also really benefit climate justice, is all about um, interdisciplinary research. Uh, one of the, the big things about open science nowadays um, in modern research, I, sh I should say, is there's no real siloed uh, fields of research like you would have maybe you know a few decades ago that you have biology physics chemistry now there's a lot of interdisciplinary research which is being generated and maybe uh, um, someone can also reflect on this um, I don't know Bjorn if you wanted to reflect more on that and maybe um, some of the other speakers uh, if I may again sure uh, please at, at the start of the whole story of uh, near years and years uh, we found we found ourselves isolated in the sense that we are atmospheric scientists uh, my group at least uh, so you had uh, an algorithm or many algorithms uh, to calculate fluxes and from uh, aircraft from stations in the earth on, on, on the ground but uh, obviously not from ships although uh, i tried a lot uh, for eight years but uh, we found ourselves isolated then uh, we met it people information technologies and we managed uh, through an interdisciplinary thought and way to persuade them and they persuaded us that uh, it's a very good thing if we gave them the algorithms, they will try and put it up on Zenodo and uh, make it publicly available by interacting for the past three years. We had ups and downs, <laughs> but the interdisciplinarity there is very, very clear. Uh, information technologies and us, we managed to work together and um, produced uh, produce um, algorithms that are usable by everyone not strictly by our group that we understand we made them available to the public uh, it's a, uh, we are very excited by this working together with information technologies because I could I couldn't understand anything about information technology <laughs> and they couldn't understand anything about the work we are doing so uh, it was very exciting and it was very successful. That's why you're very pleased. Thank you. Great. That sounds like a, a great success story. Um, so, Anne, you, you had your hand up and there's a question for you, of course, in the, in the chat as well. Uh, but maybe you also want to pick up on this. 
Yeah, I just wanted to mention for the interdisciplinary aspect that you know, the way we used to work, and this is exactly what Bjorn Weiss mentioned, mentioned before, the, the way we used to work is we, we were working alone uh, in the lab, and we were working with close collaborators that were presented to us, especially when you are a young researcher. Like now the world is open to us and it's much easier, I find, I find to approach even uh, like new collaborators in the open science framework. So for me, this is really very, very important. And this is exactly what he mentioned. We are really supported when we are trying services or when we are trying these tools. Well, in my lab, when I'm struggling, I'm alone. And I, when I don't find any solution, I fail alone. Nobody knows about it, but I fail alone. So that's what I wanted to mention about this. Uh, for answering the question, if you could have one interface in which compiler services you mentioned, how do you imagine that? Uh, as, I'm not sure this is exactly fully mature, but for instance, what, uh, what they do in reliance with this research object portal is maybe closer to what I would expect, like one place where uh, when, when I have something about uh, the research, I know what tool to use, because it's very hard for me when I read a paper uh, to associate the paper to something that is concrete. Um, so they say, oh yeah, you can find the data here, but can you just link? Can I just click somewhere and I get the data? Can I just click and I can visualize the data? So this is probably what I would like. I'm not sure we can have one service that fits everyone. And I like the multidisciplinary aspect of uh, uh, many different services, but we need to find a way to associate a service to a, a research work. I'm not sure I answered the question properly. Sorry. No, no. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. And um, Annabella, do you have any reflections as well on, on this or um, any of the previous questions? Um, yes. <clears throat> Actually, I would like to, to answer a little bit the, the question that was given to Anne. I think that uh, what we are looking in the future, at least in the oceanographic and coastal communities, is as digital twins, uh, digital representations, where we can interact with the infrastructure to get answers. And that is probably where we are going to, to, to go to, to be able to, to bring every service in one specific way, uh, way and place that the user can interact with the, with the science, with the data, with the model results, uh, to ask questions and get answers. So I, I think that's probably what we're looking ahead in terms of information and technology, working in an interdisciplinary way with the other sciences. Uh, open Coast is a little bit of work towards that direction in the sense that what we have done could not have been done just from coastal engineers alone. They would have the capacity to build the IT infrastructure and the services. And uh, likewise, the, the, the IT people wouldn't know about the processes and the physics and the biogeochemistry to build the surface that would be useful for society. I think that uh, most of the science that we see these days are in, inherently interdisciplinary. And that's the, the way that uh, science is progressing these days. And the, 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 the complex of resources and the infrastructure like EOSC are great facilitators towards that direction. Although it takes a, a little bit of time to be able to take full advantage of, of what is there. But it's very, very rich. And the support from the people that work there is very, very good. That, that's our experience. Oh, you actually have a question as well, Annabella. Uh, you oh, spoke okay. about a supermarket. How <laughs> uh, should this be organized for you? Um, yeah, well, a supermarket, a supermarket is like a, um, an image of the process that the user from Open Coast um, is, is used. Um, I, I think it should be organized. Uh, Open Coast is just an example. Uh, I work in many fields. Uh, I, I'm responsible for the IT research division at the hydrologist department. So I work in many areas related to hydrology and the environment. And the, the, the supermarket vision is a way to 
to make sure that we have a very clear workflow for users. They know what to do. They know what they want. But sometimes it's very difficult when you give people a new uh, app, a new portal, something new for them not to spend too much time trying to understand how to use it. So I think this supermarket vision should be, it is indeed a, a usability question, talking with the users to make sure that you are doing the right thing. We are a very, uh, an applied research uh, institution. So we work very close with our users and uh, let's say 50% of our work is work that the user comes to our door and says, I want to do this, help me. So uh, I think it's very important for any research that is being done to be successful. And uh, it's not only nice to write papers, it's very nice to, to make sure that the people we were thinking on, when we build something, that it, they are going to use it, okay? I, I measure success by that. Papers are very important also, but uh, I think when we, we are able to put our research, people that work in applied research, in the end of the users and they use it, I think we did a good job. Absolutely, real world uh, changes that happen as a consequence of research. Yeah, that's absolutely. Uh, Bjorn. Yeah, I wanted to also quickly touch on this notion of uh, an interface to compile all services. I think uh, some of the ways that we're going is um, we're we're building all of these containers, you know, like Docker containers or Singularity containers that kind of host compiled um, uh, versions of our software in which you as a user, you can just pull to the environment that you're working in. So you don't need to really compile things anymore. And I certainly see that there's a direction that we're going in that in that way. And just um, also jump, so jumping on what uh, um, Annabella was saying about digital twins, I think there what we're thinking about is this sort of interactive modeling, exactly what you presented with your open coasts idea. So being able to set up models interactively, run different what if, what if scenarios, for example, put a barrier here, run another simulation and do this, doing this in an interactive way, I think that'll be the big challenge that we will need to overcome in the next couple of years or decades. And um, what I think will be very intriguing is this idea of sort of community modeling approaches using application programming interfaces as opposed to, for example, source code. Um, I think that's an interesting notion to pursue. Great, thanks for that. I, um, I just had a question, I go back to something that I think both Professor Upsamanak has said, and also I think Annabella, you, you touched on it and maybe others as well, but that's the idea of expense, the, the, the cost of a lot of the equipment, the data, et cetera, and how open science in terms of climate justice and uh, equity, how this um, is a real driver towards that. And do you have, any of uh, any of the speakers, um, any uh, practical examples of this and how this might have benefited in low and middle income countries, etc. That um, yeah, the cost has been reduced for these countries in terms of the research that they can do, um, embracing open science and so forth. Um. If you allow me, I have to leave soon for I'm traveling. So, but I, I can say that um, we obtain, not we obtain, we use two methods for our work. And the second method, or chronologically, the first method, um, it was introduced in the late um, 50s, early 60s, uh, from Air Harwell in UK. Uh, it has become now so cheap to run. Um, using very cheap uh, instrumentation and with the correct algorithm, in our case, in uh, uh, calculating fluxes of uh, energy, greenhouse gases, F1 and so forth, uh, using mass balance, um, that um, third world countries or countries who are not uh, um, give so much money for things like that uh, should be able to use. So uh, we had that in mind. What you said, 
it was in our mind also. And um, uh, even um, uh, people who are um, uh, in the agricultural sector uh, could use them very, very cheaply. And so, yes, we had that in mind and we hope a lot of people who, uh, at least in the agricultural sector, will accept this uh, fact and uh, try and use it to uh, obtain the carbon footprint of their products. It's very, very important uh, that trying, in trying to obtain the carbon footprint of their products, uh, they use uh, less energy, uh, less uh, they they use less um, uh, phosphorus. Um, um, they they put a lot a lot of less things in the in the in the field. They use a lot of less diesel, and they try to counterbalance all these things by the CO two um, uh, drawdown to to their plants. So it's another way of saving energy uh, for the planet, and they have. Uh, products that they are uh, acceptable to the public uh, as taking care of the environment. Uh, I don't know if I'm understanding all these things. No, no, I, I, perfectly, perfectly. Thank you. And we actually have, okay, we're uh, actually at the top of the hour, but let's uh, just um, run with this and then end. Uh, but we have Bjorn and Anne also uh, wanted to speak, please. So, um... What you just mentioned sort of uh, made me think a little bit about the developing world zone. So I'm from South Africa originally, and uh, one of the things that that I always find interesting, or something that we should probably think about, is as we are moving to the cloud and all of these distributed computing infrastructures, access requires good internet infrastructure, and that is something that the developing world, specifically or particularly in Africa, they use cell phones predominantly. So then. <laughs> Then we have to think about how do we make those services available to those end users who do not have the infrastructure to to connect to it. So that's another another thing to take into consideration specifically around talking about climate justice. I think that's a great point. Yes, uh, internet or uh, isn't always available in the same manner everywhere. Absolutely, um, Anne. Yeah, I think this is, uh, I mean, what you mentioned, Bjorn, is, uh, is also what I wanted to mention about the internet access. So we having uh, like workflows that uh, uh, someone can submit and uh, uh, run like in the background, it's very important. But I also wanted to mention maybe like the people and community aspect, where now most of the uh, publication are done by Western countries and most of the researchers are usually from Western countries and they are like imposing their views of uh, how uh, data should be analyzed and what should be done, even in uh, like uh, lower income countries. I think open science can try to not uh, to reverse or at least to have a more bi-directional discussion on how should, uh, things should be done uh, and how uh, things can be tackled uh, in, in other countries. So to open the dialogue uh, and not only come and say, you see, I've done a great research, now you take it. Uh, and I think this is very important for climate justice. Excellent, thank you. Okay, <laughs> all the hands are coming up. Annabella, and then maybe we will uh, conclude, but please, Annabella. Okay, so just a, a, a very quick remark. Uh, we have many users from low-income uh, countries in open calls. And uh, usually what they ask that's not there is the, the ability to, to have this in a continuous way, what is necessary to have this in a continuous way. And the reason is that data, <clears throat> either open or non-open, is very scarce on a local uh, basis. They have the satellite data, of course, like we all have, but local monitoring networks are very scarce. Sometimes they were destroyed or sometimes they don't have any, any monitoring stations at all. So they look at these type of systems supported and validated with some data as a way to know their, their, their coastal systems. So it's somehow the, the ability to have all these networks of knowledge and resources, global resources or European resources makes uh, the science available to everyone. So I think 
it's very important and that they they have very different requirements in the sense on how they use this type of tools completely different from the western uh, countries like and so it's a very good experience and very challenging brilliant Thank you so much and to all the speakers and we've come to the end of our time and thank you again to the speakers to, for your stimulating talks and uh, for this discussion and I hope we can continue this discussion at some point in, in the future. Um, thank you to everyone and um, hope to see you again soon. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you very much, everyone. Goodbye. Bye. Thank you.